before we begin, let us bow our heads for a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, my wife and I, we thank you for this opportunity that we have once again to stand on holy ground in this your pulpit. Father God, I ask that you would cleanse each and every one of us, my wife and I, from anything that we have said, done, thought, that has not been in keeping with your pure and holy and righteous character. Father God, we have just sung, we have just prayed moment by moment. We pray that you would draw us so that we can spend a moment with you now and hear from your heavenly throne room. Lord, we know know that you never fail to give us the help we need and that if we have you in our hearts and we have no need of fear i pray that you would speak to us through your word speak to us living faith and lord may we receive power from on high that the smooth as and and allow you to smooth the the boisterous storms and that rage in our life, and that you would deliver us from the danger as you see best. Father God, put your words in my mouth and speak through me now. This is my prayer, and I thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Well, as you can see from the title screen, uh, the sermon is entitled The Perfect Storm. And our scripture reading comes from Psalm 107, verses 29 and 30. Psalm 107, verses 29. Uh, scriptures will be on the screen, but um, I encourage you to follow along in your Bibles and to uh, see, as the scripture says, if these things are so. Psalm 107, beginning at verse 29. He maketh the storm a calm, that the waves thereof are still. Then are they glad because they be quiet. So he bringeth them unto their desired haven. Tropical cyclone Yasa was the strongest tropical cyclone in the South Pacific since tropical cyclone Winston in 2016, as well as the fourth most intense tropical cyclone on record within that tropical cyclone basin. <laughs> Storms are categorized on a scale of one to six. It was the second category five severe tropical cyclone in 2020 in the South Pacific cyclone season. Yasta was disturbance as well as first tropical cyclone and severe tropical cyclone of the 2020-21 South Pacific cyclone season. Yasa maintained its intensity and became more defined on satellite imagery as it bore down on Fiji. An address was sent to the entire to the entire country from your nation's prime minister regarding preparations for the coming storm. Shipping services were halted and fishermen were advised to not go out into sea due to fears of Yasa possibly injuring or killing them. Multiple warnings were issued, including heavy rain, heavy wind, and, fl and flood warnings. Soon, the entirety of Fiji was under warnings as tropical cyclone Yasa neared. The Prime Minister called on Fijians to prepare for the impending cyclone. He urged communities to use the intervening time period to calm before the storm to trim tree branches, clean chains, board up homes, prepare emergency kits, and take other steps to keep homes and communities safe. Know the location of your nearest evacuation center, he said. He called on Christians not to be caught off guard by the storm. He also reminded Fijians to listen to warnings from the authorities and she was still recovering after tropical after tropical cyclone Yasai storm on the 17th of December, tropical cyclone Anna made landfall in Fiji early on 31st of January this year. 
Anna was a category two storm. And at the time of making landfall, two more cyclones subsequently downgraded were already forming off Fiji's coastline and cyclone season still had three months left to run. One storm, category five magnitude, one storm, category two magnitude. A rhetorical question for you friends. In your homeland, just because the storms differ in magnitude, should the warnings for preparation for the coming storm be any less urgent? If the warning is either of storms or rumors of storms, is the urgency of the storm warning any less forceful or of any less importance, whether the storm comes or not? I want you to remember all the, all the points I've emphasized thus far as we go through today's message. You see, the Bible mentions many storms that took place throughout the Old and New Testaments. One thinks of the flood of Noah's day, the great wind that came in Job's day, resulting in the loss of the lives of his children. The Bible says that in Jonah's day, the Lord sent out a great wind into the sea and there was a mighty tempest in the sea. The storm of Jonah's day. The Lord had to send a storm to wake up the sleeping Seventh-day Adventist who should have been proclaiming to Nineveh a message of present truth. And then in the Apostle Paul's time, while sailing the Mediterranean, he found himself caught up in a stormy, cyclonic northeast wind. Acts 27 and verse 31. Paul said to the centurion and to the soldiers, except these abide in the ship, you cannot be saved. Remember that for later, friends. The Apostle Paul, shipwrecked at sea, but not shipwrecked in terms of character. I want to talk to you today about four categories of storms that appear in the Gospels, both seen and not so readily seen. Storm category one appears in Matthew, Mark and Luke, but we'll take it up in the book of Mark. Mark chapter four. Jesus has just finished dealing with the multitude and he's exhausted. And as Jesus finished dealing with the multitude, he decides that he needs to take a retreat and move away. Mark four and verse 35. And the same day when the even was come, he saith unto them, let us pass over unto the other side. Verse 36. And when they had sent the multitude, when they had sent away the multitude, they took him even as he was in the ship. And there were also with him other little ships. He had spent the day preaching and the crowds would press upon Jesus. When Jesus had to deal with the crowds, it was a physical experience because the crowds would press upon him physically. He would preach and teach. They would keep bringing people to be healed. And can you imagine if there was someone who could heal sickness and they set up shop right there in your hometown? Can you imagine how people would, by the thousands, come around the person so their loved one could be healed? Jesus was sought after. They came and looked for him. And when they found him, he would always deliver. He would heal. He delivered every time. The Bible says that at this point, Jesus was exhausted. Verse 36 gives you a hint because it says they took him even as he was. He was exhausted. And so the first lesson I want you to get from this is that Jesus was human. We must always emphasize his divinity, but oftentimes we forget to emphasize his humanity. My brothers and sisters, Jesus got tired like you get tired. Jesus had family problems like you have family problems. His brothers and even his own parents either didn't believe him or didn't understand his ministry. Jesus had financial problems. The Bible says in Matthew 8 and verse 20, 
foxes have holes and the birds of the air have nests, but the son of man have not where to lay his head. Jesus knew betrayal. In fact, he knew Jesus would betray him when he signed Jesus, Judas up to follow him. Some of you have been betrayed, but at least you only knew you were being betrayed when it happened. Jesus had to be kind and nice to his betrayer for years. He was human, which means he experiences things like we experience things. And this is why he makes such a good judge for you and I. Because when Jesus goes to judge, he judges from the vantage point of one who has experienced life. Jesus knows what it's like to be called a fatherless child. For people to talk about his mother bad because they think he doesn't have a father. Jesus knows what it's like to come from tough surroundings. When he came, Andrew said, can anything good come out of Nazareth? Jesus understands what you're going through. And I don't know that we really can pray to him and receive the fullness of the Holy Spirit if you don't understand that he knows what you're experiencing. In the psalm, it's, in the psalm it says, he takes your tears and he catches them in a bottle. That your sorrows are written in a book, the psalmist David says. Psalm 56 and verse 8, thou tell us my wanderings, put down my tears into thy bottle. Are they not in thy book? If the God we serve says even the very hairs of your head are numbered, I submit to you that he takes note of your tears, drop by drop. In the book of God's remembrance, every act of sacrifice, every suffering and sorrow endured for Christ's sake is recorded. Every time we are sad, God records it. He understands what you're going through. I want you to know, brethren, that the first lesson to know in the storms of life, when you're discouraged, not understanding where life is going, I want you to know that Jesus understands. He knows what it's like to be abandoned, betrayed, denied, to be prejudiced against because he was different from his fellow islanders. Remember, Jesus. Jesus, as a Jew, was viewed differently by the Samaritans, because as a Samaritan, you despise the Jews. And as a Jew, you despise the Samaritans. You only have to read the parable of the Samaritan and see the reaction of the priest and the Levite. Jesus understood all of that. The Bible says in verse 37, and there arose a great storm of wind and the waves beat into the ship so that it was now full. The Lake of Galilee is noted for sudden storms of great intensity. When you research the site of where this incident took place, there are mountains in the distance and the air there is cold. The air over the water is warm and where the two differences in temperature hit, oftentimes storms begins to stir up over the lake. The reason the Bible uses the word great is to differentiate this storm from all other storms. Maybe somebody sitting here this evening is in a great storm. You're having a terrible time. Things are like a cyclone in your life right now. You're in a great storm. Maybe you just came out of one or you're about to go into one and you don't even know. There are great storms that come. So. So the storms weren't uncommon, but the Bible gives you a hint of the caliber of the storm when it says there was a great storm. Storms do come. One of the things as Christians that we have to accept in life, that we have to grasp, is that this world will never be just smooth sailing. Things are going to happen, things you cannot predict. And what I've learned personally is that storms come in all different flavors. The Bible says the storm came, the wind came, the waves beat into the ship. The ship is now full of water and everything and everybody is about to go down. 
I would imagine that by this time, Peter and some of the others are doing everything they can to feverishly get the water out of the ship. I picture some of them with buckets. Some are struggling with the sails. Some are rowing. Whatever they could do to catch the wind and thus go in the right direction, whatever they could do to, to, to find bailout water, they were working as hard as they possibly could to stay afloat and the ship still filled up with water. They are trying to fix the problem of a ship that is destined by the laws of physics to sink. And what's interesting is there are 30 men at least on the ship and one of them is Jesus except he's not involved in trying to fix the ship he's not rowing he's not struggling with the sails and this is what they say to him the bible says in mark 4 and verse 38 and when he was in the in the part of the ship and sorry and he was in the hidden part of the ship asleep on a pillow and they awake him and say unto him master Carest thou not that we perish? If Jesus is in the back of the ship, asleep on a pillow, didn't he get wet? You know you've got peace on the inside when you can sleep wet. Proverbs 3 and verse 24. When thou liest down, thou shalt not be afraid. Yea, thou shalt lie down, and thy sleep shall be sweet. Jesus is sleeping in the middle of a storm and he's perfectly fine with it. He's so exhausted and he needs the rest. So he's sleeping as the storm is coming on and the, and the disciples come and they say, listen, Jesus, we're about to die. Don't you care? I have always found it interesting among professed Christians that our assumption in the storm is always to question God's compassion. When we are in the midst of trial, it is often the response that what we're going through, obviously God doesn't care. So they wake him up. The first problem they have is they should have woken him up before the ship filled up with water. And what some of us in God's remnant church do is we work so hard to get the water out of the ships of our lives. We work feverishly to clean up the mess that we are, that we forget to wake Jesus up to do the fixing. There are folk who live their whole life in this Christian walk, trying to work their way into salvation and don't realize that the secret to keeping the ship of your salvation afloat is to wake Jesus up in your life. I challenge you, my brothers and sisters, if he's in the ship, trust him to run the ship. And so they say, Master, don't you care that we perish? Verse 39 says, Jesus woke up and he arose and rebuked the wind and said unto the sea, peace be still. And the wind ceased, and there was a great calm. What that Bible verse is saying in that great calm statement, it was more calm after Jesus dealt with the storm than it was before the storm. If you allow Jesus to wake up in your storm, he makes your situation better after the storm than it was before the storm. Object lesson for you. When Jesus was awakened to meet the storm, he was in perfect peace. Isaiah 26, beginning at verse three. I will keep him in perfect peace, whose mind is stayed on thee, because he trusteth in thee. Trust ye in the Lord forever. In the Lord Jehovah is everlasting. Perfect peace because he rested in his father's might. Another object lesson. Jesus has the power to control the laws of physics. The ship could not sink if he was on it. 
all the laws of physics do not apply if Jesus is present because he wrote the laws. Colossians 1 and verse 16. For by him were all things created that are in heaven and that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or powers, all things were created by him and for him. Verse 17. And he is before all things, and by him all things consist. The wind wasn't just subject to him. Waves weren't just subject to him. He can speak to gravity and say in modern vernacular, chill out. He can speak to the sheer forces of wind. You are capacitated. El Mech Church, Jesus has the power to stand up in your life. And it doesn't matter what storm you're facing. He can speak to the storm and he can suspend the storm. That's who he is. You've got to keep him awake in your life. Because as long as he's in your life, as long as he's in control, it doesn't matter what storm you face, he will not allow to take you under. Psalm 77 and verse 16. The waters saw thee. The waters saw thee. They were afraid. The depths also were troubled. Asaph the psalmist said the waters were afraid of God. He's referring back to when the Red Sea opened for Moses. He says that water itself was afraid of God and the deep trembled. When the children of Israel were to pass over the Red Sea and the presence of God showed up in the midst of the children, the molecules of hydrogen and oxygen, H2O, that make up water began to panic. Uh-oh, the creator has showed up and he does not want us blocking the path of his children. He has control, brethren, even over the inanimate. Your trial my brothers and sisters cannot sink you cannot stop you as long as christ is in your life it's an impossibility with jesus in the vessel you can smile at the storm and if you find yourself not smiling at the storm you may need to ask yourself is jesus in your vessel There is a second storm of great magnitude written in the Gospels. It appears in Matthew, Mark, and John. We take it up in Matthew. Matthew 14 opens with this setting about John the Baptist, and it describes the crime in detail, how it happened. And word has spread about what has taken place, and the disciples have heard about it. And they can't understand the actions of Jesus Christ their savior. In fact, Matthew 14 and verse 13, this is all Jesus seems to find time to do. When Jesus heard of it, that is the death of John the Baptist. When Jesus heard of it, that is the wicked deeds of Herod. When Jesus heard of it, that is the injustice done to this good man. When Jesus heard of it, verse 13 says, he departed thence by ship. He does not go to see the family of John the Baptist. He does not come to the disciples and consult with them and pray with them. The Bible says that when Jesus heard of it, he left. Have you ever been in a situation where it looked like Jesus? You prayed, there was no answer. You fasted, there was no result. You trusted in the promises of God, the situation got worse. He left. The next lesson of this sermon is that when God appears to be occupied, you need to recognize that his mind is on you. We find out later in verse 23 that when he left, he prayed. When you think God's not there, he's working out the situation. He left, but he did left, but he was there. May not come when I want him, but he's always right on time. 
When it appears that God leaves, he's closer than you think. In case you forgot, it says, No, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. Well, the next thing that happens is a little strange. Because verse 14 reads, And Jesus went forth and saw a great multitude and was moved with compassion toward them, and he healed their sick. And then in verses 15 to 21, he feeds the 5,000 and gets the disciples to help him. Next object lesson. Sometimes when you're facing a storm, the best thing to do is help somebody else. We get so caught up in ourselves, moaning and crying, complaining and murmuring, saying how bad God has treated us. But God says, hey, I can solve your problem. The only problem I'm having with you is that you're in my way. So if I can just get you to take your mind off you and get you doing my work. Some of us sitting here right now, the reason your problems are not being solved is because you're trying to solve them yourself. But the passage is teaching us that if we will just get up, do God's work and get our mind off ourselves, then God can get busy on your problem because you finally got out of his way. And so you've got to grasp the context. He says, come on, brethren, let's go and feed the hungry. But remember, church, they're upset about John the Baptist. Desire of Ages, page 380. Unbelief was taking possession of their minds and hearts. Love of honor had blinded them. They knew that Jesus was hated by the Pharisees, and they were eager to see him exalted as they thought he should be. To be united with a teacher that worked mighty miracles and yet to be reviled as deceivers was a trial they could ill endure. Were they always to be accounted followers of a false prophet? Would Christ never assert his authority as king? Why possess such power, reveal himself in his true character and make their way less painful? Why had he not saved John the Baptist from a violent death? Thus, the disciples reasoned until they brought upon themselves great spiritual darkness. They questioned. Could Jesus be an imposter, as the Pharisees asserted? So this thing is serious now. And I'm beginning to get a picture of the real storm. You see, the real storm isn't the real storm. We've looked at the storm in Mark 4, where Jesus is asleep in the boat. We've looked briefly at this storm in Matthew 14. But the real category of storm that I want to address now is not the storm of Mark 4 or Matthew 14. The real storm, storm number three, is the one that's going on in their heads. It's not the winds and the rain and the waves of the first two categories of storms. The problem with the disciples was they were already a storm. They were questioning God, doubting God fussing with God, trying to control God, trying to correct God. And so the real storm is in their head. And I submit to you that this storm, unlike the previous two, is not as readily visible as the two previous we've discussed. If that's the way he treats John the Baptist, how's he going to treat us? If this is the way he treats a good man, a righteous man, a preacher of goodness and salvation, if that's how he treats someone who prays, returns tithe, lives the health message, keeps the Sabbath, dresses properly, then what can we expect of him? After all, we have our faults. We have our problems. Is this how God operates? So when they get into the ship, they are already in a storm. We're talking now about the real storm, church. What the clouds and rain do later 
is minutia, trivial to what's going on in their hearts. You see, once the devil gets you in a storm-like attitude, then you're just stormy. Snapping at people, blaming people, impatient with people. It's not the coronavirus or lockdowns or vaccinations. That's not what's scaring you. The storm is in your head. Our minds are messed up with faithlessness. And if you think I made all that up, you'll notice in both storms, the one in Mark 4 and the one we're addressing now, Jesus comes to the same conclusion about his disciples. Notice Mark 4, verse 40. Why are ye so fearful? How is it that ye have no faith? Matthew 14 and verse 31. O thou of little faith, wherefore didst thou doubt? It says in verse 20. It says in verse 23. And when he had sent the multitudes away, he went up into a mountain apart to pray. Next lesson. You prepare for storms by communing with the person who allows the storms. If you have trouble, he allowed it. If you've got sickness, he allowed it. If you've got a bad marriage, he knew it was coming. If your family members are acting like they haven't got any sense, then God knows they haven't got any sense. If the people you work with are ungodly, he knows that. So the best thing to do is to just stay in touch with the person who allowed the mess because there's nothing, because there's nothing that God allows that he cannot fix. If he permits it, he can fix it. So rather than complaining about the storm, talk to the storm tamer. We're talking about storm number three, the real storm. So Jesus says, I'm going to pray. You go in the boat, I'm going to pray. Jesus knew they were worrying. He knew they were questioning. He knew they were doubting. Brothers and sisters, oh, how we love Jesus. Because he first loved me. Because he tolerates all this foolishness in us. Don't you love him that he never turns away from us? Don't you love him that he's never turned off by us? Don't you love him? that the Lord is always allowing life situations to deal with the storms in your life, that he never gives up on bringing you to where you need to be. Don't you love the Lord Jesus Christ? Now verse 24, the full storm. The ship was now in the midst of the sea, tossed with waves, for the wind was contrary. Now, life does have storms. There are times when you really don't have money. That's a storm. There are times when you bury more than one in a year. That's a storm. There are times when a child prayed for does not live to take its first breath. That's a storm. There are times when you just don't feel good. That's a storm. Times when although surrounded by friends and loved ones, you just feel alone, all by yourself. That is a storm. They are storms, but they are storms with a question mark. You see, the real storm becomes how you respond to the full storm. God can take care of the outside storm. In the first storm, we spoke about they await Jesus and he says to the wind and waves peace be still so if you haven't got money he can bring money you haven't got a car he can bring you a car your marriage is broken he can fix the marriage but he has trouble fixing the storm in you because that storm is a decision trouble coming you can't control that no more than you can control the weather. But how you act when the weather is bad is a decision. 
How you pray when you're discouraged is a decision. What you eat to comfort yourself when you're upset is a decision. Who you call when you want to complain is a decision. The problem for God, my brothers and sisters, is this storm. There's no outer storm he can't fix, but he chooses to allow you to fix this storm. And so the outward storm shows up in verse 24. Jesus now teaches the next lesson, verses 25 to 27. But a quick review of the lessons so far. Lesson one. Jesus was fully human, and because of his humanity, this makes him a perfect high priest and judge to intercede on your behalf. Lesson two, wake Jesus up in your life before the storm comes. Keep him awake in your ship, and if he's in the ship, trust him to run the ship. Our third lesson, when Jesus was awakened to meet the storm, he was in perfect peace because he trusted, he rested in his father's might. Lesson four, we said the ship could not sink as long as he was on it. The one who wrote the laws of physics has the power to stand up in your life, speak to and suspend the storm. Lesson five, we said when God appears to be occupied during your storm, what you need to recognize is that his mind is on you. Lesson six, sometimes when you're facing a storm, the best thing to do is help somebody else in their storm. And lesson number seven, you prepare for storms by communing with the person who allows the storms. Now for lesson eight, Matthew 14 and verse 25. And in the fourth watch of the night, Jesus went unto them walking on the sea. The key word here is on. Lesson number eight. In the storm, there's the assurance you can walk on water. You see, what the Bible is teaching in this narrative is that the Christian life is a miracle. We do the impossible. Liars become deacons. Thieves become treasurers. Mean people become pastors. Self-centered people become married. Wretched people, chief sinners, become lay preachers. Church is full of people walking on water, doing the impossible. We, my brothers and sisters, are water walkers, every last one of us. Verse 28. And Peter answered him and said, Lord, if be thou bid me come unto thee on the water. Lesson number nine, church. Peter's walking on water during the storm is a decision. There is, my brothers and sisters, that moment in life when you and Jesus must have an encounter. It's not about the church not about the pastor, it's not about the elders, it's not about the deacons, it's not about the brethren, it's not about community or culture, it's now you and Jesus, your moment. And I submit to you, brethren, that the current global chaos, sorry, I submit to you that the current global chaos is that moment for each and every one here, including me, who are online this evening, where Jesus finds out who we really are. And he is calling us to have that encounter, to take that faith walk with him and to make preparations in the current storm for the coming storm. He has selected it just for you. And he's going to make that personal call to you to walk away from everything that is self-centered and self-fulfilling. And he's saying to you, now it's your turn. Step out of the boat. It's your turn to walk on water. Come. You, my brothers and sisters, have got to move from the boat of safety into a faith experience with God. Jesus said, come. You want more faith? 
Come. You want to be more committed? Come. You want to be an overcomer? Come. You want to be victorious? Come. There's a storm. And Peter is standing in the water in the boat. So he has to believe that the water he's standing in is now the same water he's getting ready to stand on. I hope you're with me, church. You've got to believe that in your storm, God can transfer your life to such an extent that you're doing the opposite of what you were doing before. Fear becomes faith. Doubt becomes trust. Unbelief becomes living faith to take that next step with Jesus. So Peter takes his first step. And as long as Peter kept his eyes on Jesus, he walked. As long as he kept his focus on Jesus, he walked. As long as he remembered who got him on top, he walked. Elmet Church, you never measure your present circumstances standing in water to your future victory standing on water. If you judge God by what you're in, he'll never get you to where he wants you to be, which is on. You've got to believe that though you may never have done right, you will do right. You've got to believe that though you've never prayed, you shall pray. You've got to believe that though you've not overcome, you will today. You've got to believe that though society around you is losing hope in the government and the authorities because of this global chaos, that because you are a Seventh-day Adventist, a child of a king, a chosen generation, a royal priesthood and holy nation, a peculiar people, your God is able and he will keep your head above the crowd and you will not lose your hope in your captain, Jesus Christ, in the storm. And so lesson nine, walking on water is a choice. It's a decision. And as Peter began to slide up and down on those waves, beginning to feel good on water, he forgot his source. He took his eyes off his savior. Satan made sure that a wave came between him and Jesus and he began to sink. The Bible is claiming verse 30 of Matthew 14, he began to sink. But give Peter credit because when that brother began to sink, he cried out in fear. Now, it wasn't a pastoral prayer. It wasn't a so-called prayer warrior prayer. Not when you're sinking in 50 billion gallons of water. Then it's time for a noun, a verb, and a pronoun. Peter cried, Lord, save me. There comes a time, my brothers and sisters, when there is no need for posturing, no need for dramatics, no need for eloquent wordplay. When you are in trouble, ask for help. It doesn't matter how long you've been in the church, ask for help when you're in trouble. We are not concerned about how much tithe you've returned, how many Sabbath you've kept, or what offices you hold. Ask for help when you're in trouble. When you're in trouble, be humble and ask for help. Lord, save me. Save me. Lord, it's me, Dean Campbell. Save me. And so lesson number 10 is when you're in trouble, before the waves and the storms of life move you from on to under, ask Jesus for help. Matthew 14 and verse 31. And immediately Jesus stretched forth his hand. The man is sinking. Jesus didn't even ask him, do you repent? He couldn't answer. His mouth was full of water. When you're in trouble, in the storm, there's always a stretched out hand from your savior, Jesus Christ. You see, my brothers and sisters, I believe 
that the same wave that came up between Peter and Christ, that blocked Peter's view of Christ, is the same wave that swept him to Christ. Let me explain. The problems that often come into your life that look so terrible, petrifying and disastrous, those, my friends, are what are bringing you to Christ. That thing you thought was so terrible, church, God uses that very thing to bring you near to Jesus. He knows that if that thing does not take place, you'd never cry out for help. God has a way of testing you. He's going to keep pushing the storm at you until he gets the storm out of you. He's going to keep sending those storms until you learn not to get stormy. And your attitude as a Christian cannot match the circumstances and the mindset of the world outside. You see, you cannot, as a believer, be locked down if Jesus says, the Son therefore shall make you free, you shall be free indeed. You cannot, as a believer, subscribe to the foolishness of Black Lives Matter or that any life matters over that of another, when Jesus said, for God so loved the world, that he gave his only begotten son. Not for God so loved this race of people, or this class of people, or this skin tone of people, for God so loved the world. And you cannot, as a Christian, subscribe to the lie that climate change will end the world when Jesus said, while the earth remaineth, Seed time and harvest and cold heat and summer and winter and day and night shall not cease. And this gospel, he says, and this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations. And then shall the end come. Our scripture reading again. He maketh the storm a calm so that the waves thereof are still. Then are they glad because they be quiet. So he bringeth them unto their desired haven. There is a category six storm coming in church. Revelation seven, beginning at verse one. And after these things, I saw four angels standing on the four corners of the earth, holding the four winds of the earth, that the wind should not blow on the earth, nor on the sea, nor any tree. And I saw another angel ascending from the east, having the seal of the living God. And he cried with a loud voice to the four angels, to whom it was given to hurt the earth and the sea, saying, hurt not the earth, neither the sea, nor the trees, till we have sealed the servants of our God in their foreheads. The Apostle John beheld four angels standing on the corners of the earth, holding the four winds of the earth, that the wind should not blow on the earth, nor on the sea, nor on any tree. These symbols, friends, are illustrative of the troubles that will come upon the earth, but that the angels of God have been mercifully holding back until the servants of God should be sealed in their foreheads. Revelation 7 details who will stand in that day in the coming storm. Now the coming storm, this category six storm, has a number of elements or components to it. Allow me to explain. Great Controversy chapter 36 is entitled The Impending Conflict. And on page 588, we are told about three of those components that make up or are at the forefront of the conflict. In that paragraph three, the line of distinction between professed Christians and the ungodly is now hardly distinguishable. Church members love what the world loves and are ready to join with them. And Satan determines to unite them in one body and thus strengthen his cause by sweeping all into the ranks of spiritualism. Papists, host of miracles as a certain sign of the true church, will be readily deceived by this wonder-working power. And Protestants, second group, have cast away the shield of truth, having cast away the shield of truth, will also be deluded. 
hippies, Protestants, and worldlings would alike accept the form of godliness without the power. And they will see in this union a grand movement for the conversion of the world and the ushering in of the long expected millennium. Apis, Roman Catholicism, whose affiliation is to the beast. Second class, Protestants, the professed Christian world who give their allegiance to the beast. And then there's this third group. Ellen White calls them worldlings. Now you will notice they have no religious affiliation like the previous two groups. Yet how will Rome, how will Rome, the papacy, get them on board for the impending conflict? There is an agenda rapidly building momentum in these days, globally. And it is that of the climate change agenda. One such movement within the agenda is the Green Sabbath Project. And if you go to their web page, you will see the following screenshot. It says, and these are their words, is there nothing you can do about the environment? Question. Nothing may be one of the best things you can do. One day every week, do nothing. You see, friends, when mortal man, whether they be from religious institutions or political institutions, tells you that we only have X amount of years to save the planet, or that by 2030, which seems to be the common date given, if we haven't done this, that, and the other, that the planet will be no more. If I follow the crowd and I take my focus off Jesus, I will lose sight of the fact that Jesus said the following, and we've read it already. This gospel, when this gospel is preached in all the world for a whip, then and only then shall the end come. So according to Jesus, the end comes when the gospel is preached. Not when the Pope speaks, not when climate change dictates. Christ Object Lessons, page 6. 59 paragraph one. Christ is waiting with longing desire for the manifestation of himself in his church. When the character of Christ shall be perfectly reproduced in his people, then he will come to claim them as his own. Our Savior is not waiting for the Sunday law. Our Savior is not waiting for, for, for climate change legislation. Our Savior is waiting for his character to be perfectly reproduced in you and I. And then he promises he will come and take us home. Great Controversy, page 589, paragraph two. Satan works through the elements also to garner his harvest of unprepared souls. He has studied the secrets of the laboratories of nature and he uses all his power to control the elements as far as God allows. And if you think that man cannot manipulate the weather, uh, just do your research. When he, was, when he was suffered to afflict Job, quickly flocks and herds, servants, houses, children were swept away. One trouble succeeded another as in a moment. Even now, she says, he is at work. In accident, in calamities, by sea and by land, in great conflagrations, that's great fires in fierce tornadoes and terrific hailstones, in tempests, floods, cyclones, tidal waves and earthquakes, in every place and in a thousand forms, Satan is exercising his power. He sweeps away the ripening harvest and famine and distress follow. He imparts to the air a deadly taint and thousands perish by the pestilence. These visitations, are to become more and more frequent and disastrous. Destruction will be upon both man and beast. Note the following. And then the great deceiver will persuade men that those who serve God are causing these evils. The class that have provoked the displeasure of heaven will charge all their troubles upon those whose obedience to God's commandments is a perpetual reproof to transgressors will be declared that men are offending God by the violation of the Sunday Sabbath 
that this sin has brought calamities which will not cease until Sunday observance shall be strictly enforced. And that those who present the claims of the fourth commandment, thus destroying reverence for Sunday, are troublers of the people, preventing their restoration to divine favour and temporal prosperity. Papists will be at the head of this and on board. Protestants will be on board. And the worldlings, under the guise of climate change, who are encouraging and who will be encouraging, especially off the back of this coronavirus crisis, they're encouraging us to rest one day a week. They will be on board. My brothers and sisters, all friend, all roads lead to Rome. And the whole world, the Bible says, wandered after the beast. The ruin of Jerusalem, as predicted in Matthew 24 by Jesus, was a symbol of the final ruin that shall overwhelm the world. The prophecies that fulfilled a partial fulfillment in the overthrow of Jerusalem have a more direct application to the last days. We, my friends, are now standing on the threshold of great and solemn events. A crisis is before us. A storm is before us of such magnitude. The Bible says a time of trouble such as never was. Such as the world has never witnessed. And so my question, member of Elmex, Seventh-day Adventist Church, how well does your anchor hold in the storms of life? Will your anchor hold in the coming storm? What preparations are we making for the pending conflict? Wake Jesus up in your life right now. Let him take control before the tempest begins to blow and before the waves begin to rage. Now, I believe that the magnitude of the storm in your life comes down to how you view the storm in your life. Sometimes a light drizzle becomes a deluge. Other times you open your eyes to find yourself by still waters. Sometimes you hear thunder clapping before the rain comes. Other times, the clouds disappear so you can see a billion stars in the sky. At 80 degrees, the water of the autumn week of 1991 was still very warm, almost tropical. But the seasons had changed in New England and a cold front from Canada was racing across the northeastern corner of the country. At the same time, a hurricane was forming in the warm ocean water, moving toward a collision with the cold front in what soon became known as the perfect storm. The Andrea Gale had a crew of six, and a small fishing vessel was caught square in the crosshairs of the colliding storms. The fishing vessel went down sometime after midnight on October 8th. And ironically, ironically, its search and rescue satellite aided tracking system washed ashore a week later on Sable Island. Strangely enough, the tracking device was found with its power switched off. Could it have been an accident? Or was it a case of a storm so overwhelming, so devastating? that the captain of the ship simply turned the device off as a symbolic gesture of giving in to the worst storm he'd ever seen. You, my brothers and sisters of Elmet Church, have a heavenly tracking system sent to aid and guide our lives and lead us to glory. He's called the Holy Spirit. And when his power is permitted to be on in our lives, then we have that heavenly guidance that sees us through no matter the weather, no matter how seemingly overwhelming and devastating in the storm. John 14, 16, I will be the Father, Jesus says, and he shall give you another comforter that he may abide with you forever. Even the spirit of truth, 
whom the world cannot receive because it seeth him not, neither knoweth him not. But ye, Elmet Church, know him, for he dwelleth with you, Elmet Church, and shall be in you, my brothers and sisters. Jesus says, I will not leave you comfortless. I will come to you. We have an anchor, a steadfast, sure anchor that keeps the soul in perfect peace. And not one of you here, my brothers and sisters, not one of you here rides the boat alone. Believe in him and trust in his never failing capacity to gird you, comfort you, lead you and guide you through the seen and the unseen storms of life. We are all in this boat together. But what I want you to know for sure, what I want you to know, my brothers and sisters, is that with Jesus in your vessel, you can smile at the storm. Amen. Uh, my brothers and sisters, uh, if I could make one appeal, uh, because we, we live in serious times. And I don't believe that the hymnal are, are the hymnal is just merely a, a, a collection of songs. Uh, these are prayers. Uh, one of my particular hobbies is to study the uh, the, the, the origins and, and, and what the writers were going through when, when they wrote these hymns. So if I can make one appeal uh, as you go through 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 the Sabbath hours, meditate on this hymn. Yeah. Because we are we're asking God to guide us, but within that, the, we must confess our weakness and that he is mighty to save. Let us bow our heads for a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we have seen through your words that there is no storm mightier than you. You can speak to the wind and the waves and say, Peace be still, and there'd be great calm. And even when the storms are raging, Lord, we have the confidence that if we keep our focus on you, we can walk on water. But Father, sometimes the reason why we have such little faith is because the storms are raging within. We apologise to you as a church family, Father God, for those moments this week where we have taken our eyes off you. We're in our self-sufficiency, we're in our self-sufficiency, our pride maybe, our lack of spending time with you. We tried to walk the water, we tried to to, to walk through the storms of life on our own and how quickly, Lord, we found ourselves beginning to sink. Whether in word, deed, or in thought, where we have sunk, where we have come short this week, Father God, we ask for forgiveness, we apologise, but we thank you that there's always your stretched out hand to pull us back on top of the water and walk us safely back to the boat. It is my prayer, Father God, that you would speak your words, peace be still, to someone online today. That, Lord, you would speak to them about the storm, the situation they are going through. And Lord, that within them, it would be great calm. Be thou their vision, Father God. Keep their minds in perfect peace and give them that assurity that as long as they keep you awake in the vessel, they can smile as they sail through the storm. So, Father God, help us to make the, pre the preparations we need to do daily for the ultimate storm that is to come. But Lord, we know that when the storm comes, as long as we have you in our hearts, you will keep us and guide us through and you will come 
and to take us home. This is our prayer as a church family. Pray in Jesus' name. Amen.